I hope y'all don't mind. We may be short numbers, but I'm still going to preach like it's 500 years. Is that all right? Yeah. Amen. Hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> I just figured you'd still sleep, brother. I didn't know. I was just trying to keep you awake. <laughs> I, I've, I've never been accused of not having enough volume. And uh, so <laughs> we are going to uh, be looking here in Genesis chapter number 17. I've been telling you now for about a week or so since uh, since we finished up. Just look ahead. Read ahead. Anybody, anybody able to look ahead? I hope you was able to and kind of get an idea as to how far I would go and uh, different things of that nature. I'm probably not going to go as far as you thought I was. And um, it's, it's only going to be about three, cha- three verses about as far as we're going to get tonight. And I can't even promise that we're going to get through that. Okay, but I don't, don't want to give you so much that you walk out of here and your head's spinning. And I want to give you enough that you walk out of here and say, man, I wish he'd have gone longer. Or man, I want to go home and look at that myself, right? And so that, that's the goal. If that's at 20 minutes, that's where we're going to stop. If that's at an hour and a half, that's where we're going to stop. Amen. All right. Genesis chapter 17, verse number one. When you find your place, let's stand together, all who can and will. And yes, I need the fan. <clears throat> all right. I'll be moving around and might jump a chair or two and... You never can tell. Genesis chapter 17, verse number one. The Bible says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and talked, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. You can be seated this evening. Thanks so much for standing as we honor the reading of God's word. Uh, This evening, we'll be getting back into our study on Abraham and uh, getting started here in chapter number 17. There's much that we can grasp from the Word of God here whenever we get into this chapter. So much going on just in this short little chapter of what, 27 or so verses, I believe it is. This chapter is one that God once again renews His covenant with Abraham. How many times have we seen that? We've seen Him talk about it several times in the chapters that we've studied. He renews His covenant here with Abraham. And after some 13 or 14 years, I believe it's about 14 years of silence, he comes to Abraham again in this chapter. We'll find that this chapter that he changes the names of Abram and Sarah to Abraham or Abram and Sarah to Abraham and Sarah. And uh, those names are changed. Ishmael is blessed to become a great nation and the house of Abraham all get circumcised there towards the end of the chapter. Now we'll be spending some time over the next few weeks exploring this chapter, digging in, mining out some nuggets, if you will, over the next couple of weeks and trying to gain a better knowledge of the things of God, as well as what the things in Abraham's life that he's, that's being asked of God. Now, I want to start this evening as we preach on this thought. When God speaks. When God speaks. Now, if you'll remember, I just said a moment ago that there's about 14 years here that separates the end of chapter 16, verse number 20 or 16, 16, 16, Genesis 16, 16. It says there in 16, 16, Abram was four score and six years old. Then we find out that in 17 verse 1, when Abram was 90 years old and nine. So we find out there was 13, 14 years uh, of time there. Well, what was said in that time between Genesis 16, 16 and Genesis 17, 1? Well, apparently nothing that God wanted recorded, right? As we see, there's a big gap there. So for 13, 14 years, as far as we know, God was silent to what he needed from Abraham. And uh, he, he now at this time has a 13-year-old boy that he had with Hagar. and We know his name to be Ishmael as we've looked in uh, times past. And uh, so this evening, I want to look here at when God speaks. When God speaks, we notice that Abraham does something. How about for us? When God speaks, what do we do? When God speaks, what happens in our life? 
So question that we're going to look at this evening, and I pray that we can answer this truthfully. And let me say this this evening, as we're answering this question, if the Holy Ghost of God, Brother Tom, deals with our hearts and says, that's not you, it needs to be, then I pray that we say, yes, Lord, get me there. If God says, yep, that's you, you're doing a great job, we don't say, yeah, ha, ha. we say, yes, Lord, keep me here. Amen. Make sure we're entering this with a humble spirit. And don't lie to yourself tonight, Brother Peter, because it's real easy to do. It's real easy to do and say, oh, well, I do that, I do that. Or, well, I'm not that bad, as we'll look at here in just a, a few moments. So let's just take a few uh, minutes this evening and uh, study out here in verse or chapter number 17 of Genesis. We'll look at just a few verses and see what God would have for us tonight. When God speaks. Brother Mike Brown, how about you pray for us? Father, we just pray now, Lord, as the pastor brings forth your word. Lord, we just pray you just give you wisdom and clarity of speech. Yes, God. Help us. Give you boldness and your faith to be ready to say. Just going to give you all the glory. Amen. Can you imagine in your Christian life going 13, 14 years without hearing the voice of God? Can you imagine that as, as one that has talked with God and been with God and walked with God? Can you imagine going that long and not hearing from God? Um, it, it amazes me the lack of faith that we have in our day to day that we can open up the Bible and we can hear from God. We can go to God in prayer and we can hear from God. We can sit in a, in a church service and hear a man preach the word of God and we can hear the word of God and hear God's word spoken to us. And, and, and here, here we are. We have a, we have a man that we're looking at that it was silent for him for all those years. And I don't see anywhere that he went sideways during that time. He stuck with the stuff. He stayed with it. And we have to understand that when, when God deals with us in prayer and devotions and preaching, he does all that through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Abraham didn't have that luxury. Abraham didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We do today. These Old Testament saints that we are looking at are just plain built different than our Christians today. Many of us from time to time, right? Yet the result says when God speaks should be the same still from when he spoke to Abraham to when he speaks to pastor today. It all that it should all be the same. We'll notice in the next few messages, we'll notice the obedience of Abraham through the speaking of God. There was a lot of obedience, Brother Mike Brown, that took place in this chapter. But I want to get started here this evening, if I can. <clears throat> Let's get started this evening as we look at the enlightenment from God's Word. We'll be placing most of our focus this evening <clears throat> on verses 1 through 3. We'll, we'll look at some other verses, or I'll, I'll reference some other verses in chapter 17, but not want to spend a whole lot of time there as we'll jump into those a, a, another time. But notice in the enlightenment from God's word that God desires, God desires for us to be enlightened. He desires it from us. He desires that to be done through his word and, and through his speaking. He wants us to grow in the knowledge of who he is and the things of God. Just as we'll find here, Abraham does uh, for us, as well as his children, that's what God's looking at. Do y'all realize this evening that we have more opportunities to know who God is than Abraham did? You say, oh, but God spoke to Abraham directly, does he not you? I mean, we have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost of God, indwelling us, staying within us all the time. How do we not know who He is? Yeah. That's why this series coming up after the Mind series is going to be so important for us. We're going to cover a lot of things in that. And I know I keep talking about it. I got a date for that, by the way. I'll let you know later when I'm going to do that. Mine series is almost over. I got a couple things planned. But by the end of May, we'll be in that series. And um, it may be the last Sunday of May. I think it is. But uh, anyway, I've, I've worked all that out today. And But anyway, we need to know who he is. And the way we're going to do that, Brother Peter, is getting to know him. Getting to know him. 
spending time with him. He wants us to be enlightened. God desires that we are, but we must understand that we are today as close to God as we want to be. Amen. We know as much about God today as we want to. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. My mind's not like it used to be. We know as much about God today as we want to. Because I promise you, you can look at something else that tickles your flesh or, or excites your flesh a little bit, a little worldly stuff, and we can memorize that, no problem. I can prove it to you. We all, whenever we start singing these hymns, pull out our hymn books, do we not? We've been singing these things 20, 30, 40 years. We know these songs. But I promise you today, if played something from your childhood that you ain't heard in 20, 30, 40 years, you could probably sing every word of it. Why? Because it tickles the flesh. Amen. Amen. We're all guilty of it. I'm not looking at y'all and saying, hey, y'all be like me. Don't be like me. I'm just, I'm just as carnal as the rest of you. Amen. We just got to make sure that we reckon that mess dead. But understand this tonight. We are as close to him as we want to be. The question is, are we taking full advantage of the tools in which God has been, has given to us? Guys, we have a Bible. That's worth saying amen. We have a Holy Ghost. We have the Holy Ghost. We have prayer. We have communication with God at any time, at all times, Brother Mike Brown. I can go to him. It don't matter if I'm riding down the road. It don't matter if I wake up in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning. I can spend time with God. He's never going to be like, oh, man, why did you call me? Yeah. No, he's right. Yes, son, what you need? What is it? Well, he's always there to hear. He's always there to answer. And I thank God that he's welcoming my cries anytime that I go to him. Just as we want our children to grow and develop, so does God for his children. My goal is to raise that young man right there to be a better man than me. Absolutely. I want him, Brother Peter, to be a better father than I am to him. Now, I don't want him to look at his kids and say, well, my dad was a sorry daddy, so I ain't going to do that to you. That's just stupid. Right. Y'all be thankful that you got a dad that raised you and took care of you. You're here today, you ain't dead. They obviously fed you and took care of you. Amen. <laughs> and had some restraint because they could have snapped your little twig neck if they wanted to. Anyway, that's beside the point. But I want to raise her to be a godly woman. Now, I don't know nothing about that, but she got a mama that does. Amen. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us, Brother Peter, to be raised as just like him. He wants us to be in the image of his son, right? He wants us to be just like Christ. That's the reason we are Christians tonight. He provides us every tool necessary. I wonder how it makes the Lord feel that he's more interested in our growth than we are. There seems to be a great disinterest today in the things of God, even in so many, in any of many so-called churches today. They don't really care who he is. Why, why are churches canceling so many services? We might move a service here or there, but we still go to meet. Amen. Amen. But I see churches that are, and look, I understand Wednesday nights are tough. Thursday nights are tough on everybody. But that ain't a reason to cancel service. I talked to pastors before that say, well, I'm canceling service because I can't get nobody to come out. I said, how many of you reckon is going to come out if the doors are closed? Yeah. He said, Pastor, what would you do? I'd beg God to give me people that want to be faithful. Yeah, he said, oh, that's ugly. Well, that's just the truth. Amen, Brother Mike. Am I right? That's exactly what I would do. Now, I know it's tough. I know it is. But we ain't canceling just because things get tough. We want to know more about the Lord. You say, I can read my Bible at home. Praise the Lord. Then why don't you further down the road than you are? Again, you know, I mean, that's just, that's just being true. Brother Tom, that's not ugly. That's just truth. True stuff right there, all right? Hosea 4.6 says this. 
You'll know it when I start reading it. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Pretty strong words right there, Brother Pete. If you're, if you're reading those words and looking at it, <clears throat> he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. There was no excuse in Israel's day for having a lack of knowledge spiritually. Jeremiah says repeatedly that God had sent his prophets early, early to the Israelites to teach them. Jeremiah 7.25, you can write that reference down. He says, since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, he says, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. He said, I've sent them to you. Since the days of your father, you've had somebody speaking my word. Why are you no further down the road than you are? Amen. Amen. Guys, I don't know how you grew up. I know from testimony of some of you how you grew up. I've always had one of these around. It's pretty much it. it I, I remember growing up, Brother Mike Brown, it, it was the, it sat on a coffee table and it was a good place to put flyers to press them and, you know, you know, keep them in there. And then you got, you got flowers, sorry, not flyers, flowers. Oh, Matt's not here. Y'all understand what I'm saying. But it's a good thing just to press them. Uh, that's, that's what you did. You kept pictures in there, family pictures, stuff like that. And uh, it didn't get opened a whole lot. That big one didn't. I mean, but I grew up in a family that we had Bibles all over the place. And so we have no excuse. We have no excuse for not opening and looking at it. Why? Because heavens declare the glory of God, do they not? We know that we can look out and say something, not just some cosmic soup that burped and now from billions and billions of years ago, all this stuff is. You've got to have more faith than I do. To believe all that stuff. But I understand this tonight. He says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And since the day of your fathers, Jeremiah said, I have been sending you those prophets. Eight times this statement's made or similar to that statement to the children of Israel from the prophet Jeremiah concerning what they had been given. And yet they were still rejecting the knowledge of God. A lot like today. They give a little, a little, if any, attention to what God has provided for them. God's given us somebody to preach to us. God's given us many Bibles. Anybody here only have one Bible? If you do, I'll give you another one. That way I can be right every time you got at least two. <laughs> I got, hey, I got. Four, five, six. I got seven Bibles underneath my pulpit. Six Bibles underneath my pulpit and seven sitting on top. I've got another probably 20 back there in the back. If you need one, we'll get you a good King James in your hand. But we've been given many Bibles. We have them at home. We have them in our cars. Hey, my goodness. How many of you got them on your phone? Brother Mike Brown might. Probably don't. <laughs> but I bet he's got it on his iPad. See that? There we go. We got them everywhere, right? We, we've got them. I, you know, I, I'm thankful for that. So thankful that we live in a day that we can have a Bible with us wherever we go. However, we are without excuse of knowing when God speaks. We have different commentaries that we're able to look and read behind men that we don't use in lieu of the Bible, but we use them in conjunction with the Bible. I'm able to look and say, all right, well, God spoke to this man this way in this scripture. Wow, that is awesome. I see that. Or that goes with this scripture, this scripture. I see that. Not every commentary that I've ever read has been right. There are mistakes. Not everything that I have thought from the scriptures has been right. Amen. I, I am fallible. We all are, right? God desires we be enlightened. Do we have that same desire? Do we have that same desire? Next, I want you to notice that God gives the declaration. Not only we talk about his desire, but he gives a declaration. God's desire that we be enlightened through his word, but it comes by knowing who he is. That is shown here in this chapter by his declaration of who he is. 
Notice with me in verse 1. God plainly tells Abraham who he is. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, what? I am the almighty God. He told him exactly who he was. He said, I am the almighty God. The purpose of that was to clarify who he was, that he was the only one that could give this covenant to Abraham because he was the almighty God. In this chapter, we find God declaring, I will 14 times. He says, I will 14 times. I'm so, so thankful this evening to know that when God says, I will, Brother Peter, he means it. When he says, I will, Brother Tom, that's exactly what he's going to do. He, it's exactly what he's going to do. He, there's nothing that will stop that. You say, well, what if I mess it up? You won't. You won't. Because if you could, then God would have put a prerequisite on it. But he didn't. He said, I will. And God's not going to leave it in your hands to find out if it happens. This is not going to happen. He's not going to say, I will, if Reggie does this. That's exactly what he would say. But he says, I will. 14 times in this, uh, in this chapter. I'll give them to you. I'm not going to read the scripture. Just so I want you to go back and look at them and, and study them out. Twice in verse 2. Twice in verse 6. I'm going to go fast, so go back and listen to it. Once in verse 7. Twice in verse 8. Twice in verse 16. Once in verse 19. Three times in verse 20. And then once in verse 21. So in verses 2, 6, 7, 8, 16, 19, 20, and 21... Throughout those, God makes 14 I will statements. There are some pretty big declarations that take place in this time. 14 I wills, but probably the biggest, Brother Mike Brown, is the one he's talking about there in the early part, where he's looking at a 99-year-old man and an 89-year-old woman and saying, hey, look, I'm going to give y'all that boy that you've been asking for. You know that. Hey, <laughs> right. Do you know how old I am? But God said, I will. Understand this. When God declares something, there is nothing too big for him. To those who faithfully obey and cling to the word of God, I promise you, he will provide. He will provide to them. God has given us a duty from enlightenment. Not only does he declare, so we know that he declares, but we see that he give us a duty from enlightenment. Find it there in verse number one. After he declares who he is, he says, I am the almighty God. What's what he says next? He says, walk before me. He says, walk before me. The Lord says, walk before me. When, when, the, when we walk before God, that means that we are walking in his presence. Put it like this. Brother Tom Borg said, when I walk before God, He's seeing me. He's seeing me. And I am in His sight. I'm in the sight of God. When He says, walk before me. I may mention this several times here of late, and I pray we're getting a hold of it, but to talk with God in the proper attitude requires us to have the proper awareness of who He is. Brother Peter, there's, there's times in our lives whenever we don't see Him for what He is and who right. He is. We don't look at Him as sovereign. We don't, we don't look at Him any longer as being omniscient. We don't look at Him as being omnipotent. We don't, we don't, we don't look at these different things. My goodness, we surely don't see Him as being omnipresent, do we? If we did, things would change at the house. Yeah. Things would change in the car. Things would change on these little things. Amen. Right. But we've lost the fear and the awareness of God. Seems that as the world continues, Brother Mike Brown, to drift further and further and further, so does the church. 
the church continually doing the same thing, Brother Peter. Following right along in the footsteps uh, of, uh, of the world. Say, well, as long as I'm farther away, as long as I stay away from the world, the problem is if we keep the same distance from the world, we're getting further away from God. Because would you agree with me that the world is getting further and further and further and further and further away from the Scriptures? Of course we would. We have changed, unfortunately, the way that we see Him. We have changed that the church no longer looks different. I've told y'all before, you could take a modern day youth group and put them back here at the back and then take the graduating class of worldly, hell-bound children and line them up side by side. They dress the same. They act the same. They talk the same. Their music's the same. Their entertainment's the same. Yes, I said it and I meant it. That's what we're turning out. That's what, that's what most churches are turning out. Why, why are kids leaving? They never get a hold of it. Right. Why are kids getting away from God? Because they never get a hold of it. For what reason? Is it our fault? Yes, the church's fault. Amen. You say, well, I don't like that. Talk to God. Amen. Yeah, I, I get it, guys. I get, I get it. I get it. When they get to be 18, they can make their own decision. Absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That's between them and God. But are we doing what we are supposed to be doing Getting there. Now look, I understand I'm talking to a bunch of empty nesters. There's a few of us still raising our youngins. But we ought to be encouraging, encouraging the younger generation coming up, raising children to say, hey, keep them in church. Yeah. Keep them around the things of God. I don't care I don't care what, what else is going on. Make sure that the Bible is in your home. Make sure that you're, you're with your family and talking about the things of God. Some of my favorite times is sitting around the house in the living room and just talking about the Lord. Yeah. Just talking about the Lord. It may be with our kids. It may just be me and Miss Nicole sitting there. Um, <clears throat> you know, whatever it may be. They'll walk in on it. It means something. If they walk away, I can promise you this, they're going to do it through a bunch of sl sleepless nights of prayer and, and it's going to be through a bunch of heartache of bowing down and calling their name out to God for years and years and years and years. But our attitude shows that there's no awareness of God. Now, I notice a lot with other places that they're more interested in being their being kids' friends. I've told my son, I love you, buddy, but I ain't your friend. Amen. I do. I love him. I'll always be his daddy. There's going to come a point in time where he's a grown man and he's got to make his own decisions. He ain't got to listen to daddy no more. But I ain't going to be, well, I think you're going down the wrong oh, I won't tell him he's going down the wrong, wrong road. Why? Because he's an adult? Brother Mike, why, why wouldn't I tell him he's going down the wrong road? It's still my youngin. Still my young. Just if I see you going down the wrong road, you're much, much, much my elder. And I would, <laughs> and I'd still say, Brother Mike, <laughs> I still say, Brother Mike, you're going down the wrong road. Not because I'm your pastor, but because, I'm your, because I love you. Amen. I would. So why can't I tell my son, well, he won't come back for Thanksgiving. Sorry. Sorry. I'm still going to cook a bird and we're still going to eat and get fat. Love for you to join us. Well, what would you do? I, like I told y'all back there, I pray I'd make a stance. I pray I'd make a stand. And say, look, son, I love you. But man, you ain't going down the right road. If that makes you mad, man, understand I'm doing it because I love you. Amen. But it's because we don't have an awareness of God. We're more interested in our kids liking us. We're more interested in the kids at church thinking the pastor's cool. Listen, I don't want the kids in the church to think I'm cool. 
I want the kids in the church to know that's my pastor. Yeah. And if I get out of line, he's going to get he's going to snatch me bald headed. That's what happened to Peter. He got out of line. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> See kids? Yeah. See that? I want to tell you I won't, I won't go that far. But seriously, we need to make sure that we have an awareness of who God is. We got to teach these kids to have an awareness of God. You know the worst thing that you can do? And I don't know if that's for here or if it's for the internet or whatever it is, but the worst thing you can do as a parent, as a grandparent, as a great-grandparent, as a whatever parent, as, a, as an authority figure in someone's life, worst thing you do is ever go against this. You know why? They know. They know. They know. Well, pastor preaches that, and daddy, you do this. Amen. Well, pastor preaches about uh, talking about people, and mama, you all the time run somebody down on the phone. Amen. We've got to be real careful. And we wonder why our kids walk away, Brother Peter. You know why? A lot of times they see hypocrisy in the church. Amen. I ain't necessarily talking about y'all. I'm talking about just in the church in general. But if your phone's ringing, answer it and deal with it, right? But we no longer seek God's approval just so long as Brother Tom were comfortable in our flesh. As long as I'm comfortable right here, I, I, I no, no reason to seek God's <clears throat> approval. He says not only to walk before Him, but He says to be thou perfect. Be thou perfect. This is the standard that God set for Abraham. <clears throat> Everybody understand that? That's what He set for Abraham. It wasn't just for Abraham. It's for us. It is for us. Why is it that we feel like we can't? What kind of, somebody, and I'm being serious about this, somebody give me some special attribute that Abraham had that you don't possess. There's nothing. He was just as much human as you and I are. Right? And God told him, he told him, he said, walk before me. He said, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Why would God command this of Abraham and not command it of you and I? In today's society, this has become an unacceptably high. It's become unacceptably high. We can't obtain that. So what we need to do is let's water it down. I don't know if y'all listen to preaching outside of our pulpit. I don't know if you do. If you listen to other places and uh, 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 other men, I want you to listen to other men, but I want you to listen to other godly men. Men that preach the Bible. I've listened to some that I thought, that boy's worried about a paycheck. Because he stops. He gets right on the verge of getting ready to say something that might ruffle a few feathers and he moves on. You can say, oh, well, he's just letting the Holy Ghost deal. No, he ain't neither. He's henpecked. And, and mom will get mad at him if he leaves and starts talking about everything the Bible says. There's a lot of stuff in this Bible people don't want to preach. I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of stuff in this Bible I don't want to preach. But I'm going to. I have to. Y'all didn't call me up here to skip stuff, right? Y'all didn't ask me to be your pastor to skip stuff so that y'all feel good about yourselves, right? That's not what God did. That's not what you want. I would be doing you a disservice if I got to a portion of Scripture that said X, Y, and Z, and I said, well, that's really LMN. No. Y'all don't want that. I would hope you don't want that. So there's no awareness, but he says, be thou perfect. We're not going to water down a message. What good does it do to water a message down? I'm going to end right here and we'll, we'll pick her back up next week. 
Seldom, if ever, Brother Dan, seldom, if ever, do we obtain higher than, we're, than our goal is. Seldom, if ever. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. I've been told since I was a little boy, son, whenever you are making a goal, don't shoot for the top of the fence post, shoot for the stars. Because what happens? If you shoot for the top of the fence post and you miss, where are you at? Back on the ground. But if you shoot for the stars, you're going to hit the fence post. Amen. So seldom if ever do we set our goals up here and achieve more. So why are we setting our goals here? When we want to be here. When God wants us here. Brother Mike Brown, this is what we need to shoot for. Be there. Be perfect. You say, I can't be perfect. Not in yourself. You surely can't. Not, nope. But I promise you this. If we keep this in our hands, if we keep this running through our thoughts, if we keep this running through our minds, running through our bodies every single day, if we hide His Word in our hearts, the Bible says that we might not what? Sin against Him, right? Amen. Don't water it down. Don't make excuses. Don't, don't excuse, well, this is why I can't be perfect. The naysayers will tell you you can't be perfect. They'll say that you, you, what that really means is to be complete, whole, sincere, blameless, but not perfect. Why is perfection not still our goal? You may never become perfect, but you should still try to obtain it. The word perfect means without blemish. Isn't that how God sees us? Am I right in that? God sees us that way. Why does the world not? A lot of times, we'll finish here, a lot of times, Brother Tom, the world don't see it because we don't want to be called that holy roller or that fuddy-duddy or that holier-than-thou. Boy, I wish that was the case. Well, Brother Peter, we've got to make sure that we are seeking God being without blemish. It's achievable. Because God told him, he said, walk with me and be thou perfect. Heads bowed, eyes closed this evening.